Hey, it's Jeff Bergman with SAT Success Secrets. Welcome to part two of the SAT Critical Reading Quick Fix mini course. In this video today, I'm going to show you how to find the main idea of that passage about cities that we went to the questions about in the last video. You saw the last video, I showed you how to take the main idea of the passage and apply it to answer the first half of the questions that followed that passage. Now, I know that it might not necessarily be clear for you why that was the main idea. So in this passage, in this video, I'm going to go through the passage very carefully and show you why it's important to find the main idea, why that's the biggest thing you can do to improve your critical reading score. And then I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Essentially, I'm going to show you how to separate the main idea from the details. So check out this video and I'll see you again when you're done. Hey everybody. It's Jeff Bergman with SATSuccessSecrets.com and today I want to talk to you about how to find the main idea in an SAT critical reading passage. If you've been following my blog or subscribed to my SAT tips, you know that I think the biggest thing that you can do to improve your critical reading score is to focus on the main idea of the passage. And if you really get that concept and you apply it when you're taking the SAT, your score on the critical reading section will go way up. Here's why. If you're having trouble with the reading passages, you're probably getting stuck in the details and you're missing the main idea of the passage. Sometimes when you read a passage, you might get confused by certain words or sentences or even whole paragraphs. And you might be tempted to reread those parts until you understand exactly what they mean. But I strongly suggest that you don't do that because it's a waste of your valuable time. And here's why. Most of what's confusing you is details, but not all of the details will be referred to in the questions. If they don't ask you about them, you don't have to know them. That's why it's important that you don't get caught up in the details as you read. Now, you might be asking yourself, what details do you have to know? And that's a simple answer. The SAT will tell you what details that you have to know, because any questions that ask about specific details will refer you back to specific lines in the passage. When that happens, you can go back and reread them. But while you don't need to know all of the details, you have to know the main idea uh, because most of the questions, even if they're about specific details, relate back to the main idea in some way. That's why once you know the main idea, almost all the questions get a lot easier. Now I want to show you how this works using one of the passages that was on an actual SAT given a few years ago. So here's a passage. Uh, it's actually in the SAT's blue book, the um, official SAT study guide. Uh, and take a look at it. Pause the video for a few minutes. Take a few minutes to read it. When you're done, restart the video, and I'm going to show you how to find the main idea. Okay. So here's what I mean by the main idea. The main idea, for our purposes, is the topic of the passage, what the passage is about, and the author's point about the topic. And anything other than that is just details supporting what the author is trying to say. So we're going to go through and we're going to essentially ask ourselves a couple of questions as we read. Uh, do we know the topic? And can we pick out the ideas from the supporting details? Another way to ask that question is, is this a new idea or is this just some details uh, explaining an idea that he's already been presented. If it's just details and we're not clear about it, we really don't have to know it. So follow along as I read. It starts, As a scientist, I find that only one vision of the city really gets my hackles up. The notion that a city is somehow unnatural, a blemish on the face of nature. But we can tell pretty clearly that the topic is the city or cities. Now, we also know that an idea he is presenting is that a city is somehow unnatural, a blemish on the face of nature. Now, if you know what the phrase really gets my hackles up means, then you know that this idea that the city is a blemish on the face of nature is not the author's idea, but somebody else's idea 
because really gets my hackles up means that he really doesn't like it. But even if you didn't know that, you'd have to hold that idea aside in your mind, and I'll show you how a few paragraphs later on becomes very clear that the idea of cities being unnatural is um, an idea that he doesn't agree with. So let me continue reading. The argument goes like this. Okay, now what argument? And it's the argument that the cities are unnatural. Cities remove human beings from their natural place in the world. They are a manifestation of the urge to conquer nature rather than to live in harmony with it. Therefore, we should abandon both our cities and our technologies and return to an earlier, happier state of existence, one that presumably would include many fewer human beings than now inhabit our planet. Okay. All of this, just detail that explains this idea. There is an important hidden assumption behind this attitude. Now, which attitude? The attitude that cities are unnatural. Um, I'll go back to reading. This is, there is an important hidden assumption behind this attitude, one that needs to be brought out and examined, if only because it is so widely held today. This is the assumption that nature, left to itself, will find a state of equilibrium, a balance of nature, and that the correct role for humanity is to find a way to fit into that balance. If you think this way, you are likely to feel that all of human history since the industrial, if not the agricultural revolution, represents a wrong turning, a blind alley, something like the failed Soviet experiment in central planning. Cities, and particularly the explosive post-war growth of suburbs, urban sprawl, are agencies that destroy the balance of nature and hence are evil presences on the planet. So, in this paragraph, again, He's restating the idea that cities are unnatural. And it's mostly detail, and then he sums it up again at the end. Cities destroy the balance of nature and are evil presences. Now he says, to continue reading, he says, what bothers me about this point of view? Okay, I'm going to stop there. Because if you didn't know from the phrase up top, really gets my hackles up. If you didn't know from that that the author does not agree with the idea that cities are unnatural, and you weren't sure whether it was his idea or someone else's idea, now we can tell because this point of view bothers him. So it says, what bothers me about this point of view is that it implies that human beings in some deep sense are not part of nature. Nature, to many environmental thinkers, is what happens when there are no people around. As soon as we show up and start building towns and cities, nature stops and something infinitely less worthwhile starts. The only new information, and that's not really new, is in this paragraph, is that um, he doesn't agree with this view that cities are unnatural. That's it. It's the only thing. If you got details from these three paragraphs, that's awesome. If you didn't, it doesn't matter. Now, the last paragraph in that column. It seems to me that we should begin our cities, or we should begin our discussion of cities by recognizing that they aren't unnatural any more than beaver dams or anthills are unnatural. Okay. So it seems to me, he's stating his own opinion now, um, we should recognize that cities aren't unnatural any more than beaver dams or anthills are unnatural. So that's his, his own opinion. Cities aren't unnatural. And we can state that more simply in positive terms. He says cities are natural. Okay, I'll continue to read. Beavers, ants, and human beings are all part of the web of life that exists on our planet. As part of their survival strategy, they alter their environments and build shelters. There is nothing unnatural about this. Okay, it's just details. He's using beavers and ants and comparing them to humans 
in saying that beavers, ants, and humans all alter their environment, and hence all are natural. Now to continue to read. Nor is there anything unnatural about downtown areas. Okay, we just said that people are natural, and now he's saying that downtown areas are natural. He's just extending his idea. I'll continue to read. Yes, in the town, the soil has been almost completely covered by concrete, buildings, and asphalt. Often, there is no grass or undisturbed soil to be seen anywhere. But this isn't really unnatural. There are plenty of places in nature where there is no soil at all. Think of cliff sides in the mountains or along the ocean. From our point of view, the building of Manhattan simply amounted to the exchange of a forest for a cliffside ecosystem. And if you want to know what ecosystem is, there's an asterisk there and points to the bottom. But my point is that it's all detail. There's a little bit of new information. Not really. It's just some clarifying information in this paragraph. Um, there's nothing unnatural about downtown areas. Again, it's another way to say cities are natural. And everything else just details that support it. Now I'll continue reading. Look at the energy sources of the downtown ecosystem. There is, of course, sunlight to provide warmth. In addition, there is a large amount of human-made detritus that can serve as food for animals, hamburger buns, apple cores, and partially filled soft drink containers. All of these can and do serve as food sources. Indeed, urban yellow jackets seem to find sugar-rich soft drink cans, an excellent source of nectar for their honey. Just notice them swarming around waste containers during the summer. Okay, there's no um, new information. He repeats the main idea of a downtown ecosystem. That's again, that's saying cities are natural. And then he's just talking about it. It's all details in that paragraph. I'll continue. A glimpse of downtown, in fact, illustrates that the city can be thought of as a natural system on at least three different levels. He's just continuing with his idea. A glimpse of downtown illustrates the city can be thought of as a natural system on three different levels. At the most obvious level, although we don't normally think in these terms, a city is an ecosystem, much as a salt marsh or forest is. A city operates in pretty much the same way as any other ecosystem with its own peculiar collection of flora and fauna. This way of looking at cities has recently received the ultimate academic accolade, the creation of a subfield of science called urban ecology devoted to understanding it. All details. At a somewhat deeper level, a natural ecosystem like a forest is a powerful metaphor to aid in understanding how cities work. Okay, again, natural ecosystem, cities. Both systems grow and evolve. Both require a larger environment to supply them with materials and to act as a receptacle for waste. Both require energy from outside sources to keep them functioning, and both have a life cycle, birth, maturity, and death. Again, he's just saying cities, are a natural system. Finally, I'll read again. Finally, our cities are like every other natural system. Again, he's just repeating himself and giving more details. Finally, our cities are like every other natural system in that at bottom, they operate according to a few well-defined laws of nature. There is, for example, a limit to how high a tree can grow, set by several factors, including the kinds of forces that exist between atoms and wood. There is also a limit on how high a wood or stone or steel building can be built, a limit that is influenced by those same interatomic forces. More details. And now in this last paragraph, he's summing up his main idea. Now, it's not always going to be that easy. He's not, not every passage sums up the main idea at the end. However, I point this out, and I use this passage, in fact, to show you that sometimes, if you don't understand anything in the whole passage, 
you can get to the end, and if you understand only this last part, you've still got the main idea. So, let me state this explicitly, he says. He's explicitly stating his idea. A city is a natural system, and we can study it in the same way we study other natural systems and how they got to be the way they are. All right, so I would state this main idea as cities are natural systems, and obviously the author likes cities, so he's saying that cities are good. And he's also saying, as part of making this point, that some people think that cities are not natural and that therefore cities are bad. And the author of this passage thinks that those people who think that cities are bad and unnatural, he thinks that those people are wrong. All right, so I hope that was clear. I hope you could see how essentially the main idea is just a tiny, tiny portion of that passage that's repeated by the author a couple of different times, in a couple of different wordings. And then the rest of it is just supporting details that he uses to support his point and make his argument. So that stuff, the supporting details, mostly you don't have to worry about it. If any of it was confusing, it doesn't matter that much. If you have to know the details, the line numbers and the questions will send you back to the specific line numbers, and then you'll look at it again. So I hope that served you, and I'll see you again next time when I take this main idea and show you how to use it to answer the other half of the questions for this passage.